Hi guys, this is the second video in my series on change of variables in multiple integrals. In the first video, I talked about the theory and intuition leading up to the formulas for change of variables. In this video, I'd like to go over a number of examples. As we go through these examples, one thing I want to emphasize is that there are two main reasons that you might want to make a change of variables in a multiple integral. Reason number one is to simplify the region of integration, and reason number two is to simplify the integrand itself. In single variable calculus, you don't usually see integrals where making a change of variables helps you to simplify the region of integration. So that's something that's kind of new to the world of multiple integrals. Also, as the title of the video indicates, as we go through these examples, I am going to explain how to deal with change of variables to polar, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates. As we're going through these examples, I'm going to assume that everybody is familiar with the change of variables formulas that we derived in the previous video. But just to remind you, when you make a change of variables from xy to uv coordinates, x equals g of uv and y equals h of uv, there are three things that change. Number one, f of xy gets replaced by f of g of uv comma h of uv. Number two, the region d gets replaced by a new region r. And number three, the differential dA or dx dy gets replaced by the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian du dv. If any of this sounds unfamiliar or mysterious, you can just see the previous video to learn how it all works. Of course, there's an exactly analogous formula for triple integrals, and we're going to be using this one as well when we get to our examples about cylindrical and spherical coordinates. For the first example, let's suppose that we're tasked with computing the double integral of x plus y dA over the triangular region d in the plane with vertices at negative 1, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 2. This double integral is not too bad, and you could actually evaluate it without making a change of variables. The only small issue is that the region of integration is a little bit awkward to describe as either a type 1 region or a type 2 region. That's just because whichever way you look at the region, either going from the bottom to the top or going from the left to the right, the definitions of the functions that are bounding the region change at some point in between the endpoints. As I said, that's not an insurmountable difficulty, but it turns out to be a little bit easier to integrate this function if we first make a change of variables to make the region a little bit easier to describe. In this case, it makes sense to make a linear change of variables to uv coordinates where u and v are given by the formulas x plus y over 3 and negative 2x plus y over 3. It's easy to see by just considering what happens to the vertices that this linear transformation maps the triangle D to the right triangle pictured here. Thinking ahead a little bit about the change of variables formula, we're going to want to have x and y written in terms of u and v. It's pretty easy to solve for x and y in these equations, and we find that x is equal to u minus v and y is equal to 2u plus v. Those are the functions that we call g and h in our change of variables formula. The partial derivatives of g and h with respect to u and v are easy to read off from this. Substituting them into the Jacobian matrix, we find that the determinant of the Jacobian in this case is equal to 3. That's all the information that we need in order to complete our change of variables. The original integral now becomes the double integral over r of u minus v plus 2u plus v times the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian du dv. After we clean up the integrand, it becomes 9u. We think of the region r as a type 1 region, with u going from 0 to 1, and for each value of u, v going from 0 to 1 minus u. Then we can easily evaluate the iterated integral, and we find that the value of our original integral is equal to 3 halves. This is a simple example of how change of variables in multiple integrals can be used to simplify the region of integration in a double integral. Next, I want to consider an example of how change of variables can be used to simplify the integrand in a multiple integral. Let's consider the double integral over the whole plane of e to the minus x squared plus y squared dA. We could try to evaluate this integral by writing it as an iterated integral and splitting the integrand apart as e to the minus x squared times e to the minus y squared. The issue, which you may have come across before, is that the antiderivative for e to the minus x squared is not expressible in closed form using the basic functions that you learned in calculus. There's actually more than one way to evaluate this integral, but it turns out that one of the easiest ways is to use polar coordinates. Remember that in polar coordinates, we describe points in the plane by their distance from the origin, which we call r, and the angle theta that the position vectors of the point make with the positive x-axis. I'm going to assume that everybody is somewhat familiar with polar coordinates. If we want to go from xy coordinates to r theta coordinates, then we can use the equations in pink. Of course, there are some degenerate situations to be careful of when x is equal to 0, but let's just ignore that. We're more interested in going the other direction, and once we know what r and theta are, it's easy to show that x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. These are the functions that we call g and h in our change of variables formula. 
The partial derivative of g with respect to r is cosine theta. The partial of g with respect to theta is minus r sine theta. And similarly, the partial of h with respect to r is sine theta, and the partial of h with respect to theta is r cosine theta. Those form the entries of our Jacobian matrix, and taking the determinant of that matrix, we find that the Jacobian determinant is equal to r. The Jacobian determinant for change of variables to polar coordinates is important, so you might want to remember it. Now we use our change of variables formula and remember that there are three things that change. The x squared plus y squared gets replaced by r squared. The differential dA gets replaced by r dr d theta. And also we describe the region of integration now in polar coordinates with r going from zero to infinity and theta going from zero to two pi. The reason why this change of variables was a good move is because now we can integrate the inner integral by making a simple change of variables, u equals r squared. Then du is going to be 2r dr. We can evaluate the inner integral, and once we've done that and evaluated the outer integral, we find that our original double integral is equal to pi. As I mentioned in the video text, one of the reasons why the example we just computed is important is because it gives us a nice formula for the Gaussian integral. The Gaussian integral is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. This is a commonly occurring integral in probability theory and in many other areas of mathematics. Call this integral i. Then i squared is just i times i. But notice here that I've used an independent variable of x for the first integral and an independent variable of y for the second integral. The reason for that is I now want to bring one of the integrals inside of the other integral, and then bring the integrand of the outer integral into the inner integral. Then I end up with exactly the double integral that we just computed. Since we found that the value of that double integral was equal to pi, it means that the value of the Gaussian integral is equal to the square root of pi. There are other proofs of this fact, but this is arguably one of the easiest. In the final two examples, I want to talk about triple integrals, and in particular, I want to talk about the Jacobian determinants for the transformations to cylindrical and spherical coordinates. These coordinate systems are important for many applications of multivariable calculus, for example, to physics, so it's important to understand how they work. Cylindrical coordinates are pretty easy. We describe points x, y, z, and r3 by new coordinates r, theta, and z. The z in the usual Cartesian coordinate system is the same as the z in the cylindrical coordinate system. The r and the theta in cylindrical coordinates are what you get by projecting the point x, y, z orthogonally to the x, y plane, and then describing the projected points using the r and theta from the usual polar coordinate system. In other words, r theta just describes the point x, y in the plane using polar coordinates. It's easy then to see that r theta and z and x, y, and z satisfy the equations that I've written here, with the appropriate modifications, of course, if x is equal to zero. In any case, this is enough for us to compute the Jacobian matrix. To find the first row of the Jacobian matrix, we take the partial derivative of r cosine theta with respect to r, theta, and z. Similarly, to find the second row, we take the partial derivatives of r sine theta with respect to r, theta, and z. And to find the final row, we take the partial derivatives of the function z with respect to r, theta, and z. Now, when we compute the determinant of this 3 by 3 matrix, we find that the Jacobian determinant is equal to r. To give an example of how we might apply that formula, let's suppose that we want to compute the triple integral over a cylindrical region d of the function x, y, z squared dv. The cylindrical region here is a right circular cylinder centered at the origin with radius 2 and height 6. In this problem, it's a good idea to change to cylindrical coordinates because the region that we're integrating over is very easy to describe using cylindrical coordinates. So once again, the choice for change of variables in this case is motivated by wanting to simplify the description of the region of integration. We change the cylindrical coordinates. The x gets replaced by r cosine theta, the y by r sine theta, the z is still z. The dv gets replaced by the absolute value of the Jacobian of the transformation times dr d theta dz. And now the region is easily described as r going from 0 to 2, theta going from 0 to 2 pi, and z going from negative 3 to 3. Since none of the limits of integration here depend on any of the other variables, the rest of the problem is very easy because this triple integral splits apart as a product of three single integrals that we know how to do. If you evaluate all three of these integrals and multiply the results together, you should get 18 pi as the final answer. Now let's talk about spherical coordinates. In spherical coordinates, we describe a point x, y, z in R3 by three parameters, rho, theta, and phi. The number rho is the distance in R3 from the point x, y, z to the origin. Therefore, rho squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The theta here is the same as the theta from cylindrical coordinates. It's the theta that you would use to describe the point x, y in the plane if you were using polar coordinates. Finally, the number phi is the angle between the position vector of the point x, y, z and the positive z axis. 
One thing that I should mention is that in physics they have a slightly different convention. The roles of phi and theta are interchanged. I'm using the mathematical convention. To derive the formulas that allow you to convert from spherical coordinates to Cartesian coordinates, it's helpful to first notice that the angle phi here is the same as the angle of the triangle that I've indicated. Since this triangle is a right triangle, the base of the triangle has length rho times sine of phi. Once you know that distance, you can work out what x and y are in terms of theta. x is rho sine phi times cosine theta, and y is rho sine phi times sine theta. Similarly, the height of this triangle, which is the z in Cartesian coordinates, is just rho times cosine of phi. You can also work out formulas which allow you to go from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates, but those are less important for us in this problem. We want to compute the Jacobian matrix of this transformation, and we can do so by taking the partial derivatives of each one of these functions with respect to rho, and then with respect to theta, and then with respect to phi. This is a straightforward calculation. I've recorded the Jacobian matrix for you here. In case anyone out there likes taking determinants of big matrices, I'll leave the next part of the calculation for you. When you take the determinant of this matrix, you end up getting minus rho squared times sine of phi. One thing to remember is that when we make a change of variables, we're going to want to use the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian, so that minus sign is not really important. Let's finish with a quick example involving spherical coordinates. Suppose we want to compute the triple integral over our region d of 1 over x squared plus y squared plus z squared squared dv. d here is the set of points x, y, z, and r3 whose distance from the origin is at least 1. Changing the spherical coordinates in this example is a good choice for two reasons. Number one, the region of integration is easy to describe using spherical coordinates. And number two, the integrand is going to be simpler after we change the spherical coordinates. When we switch to spherical coordinates, the x squared plus y squared plus z squared term becomes rho squared. The dv gets replaced by the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian, which was rho squared sine phi, times d rho, d phi, d theta. The region of integration is now described by letting rho run from 1 to infinity, phi run from 0 to pi, and theta from 0 to 2 pi. One detail here in case you're wondering, since phi is only going from 0 to pi, sine of phi is going to be non-negative, so I don't need to put an absolute value on that piece. Anyway, as in our previous example, since none of the limits of integration here depend on any of the variables involved, this splits apart as a product of three integrals which we know how to do. When we evaluate all three of these integrals and multiply the answers together, we get 4 pi as our final answer. This is a good example of how a change of variables can help to greatly simplify the evaluation of a multiple integral. Well, that's the end of this short series on change of variables and multiple integrals. I hope these videos were helpful to you. I'll be posting more like them on my channel soon.